All right, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us on today's Wednesday WISE webinar. My name is Sydney Tonahia. Um, I'm the Senior Coordinator of Membership with IFA, and we have a great 60 minutes lined up for you guys this afternoon. Uh, before we jump into the webinar, I'd just like to touch on two things. Um, today's webinar is being recorded, and it'll be made available later this evening on community.franchise.org. And if you have any questions for today's speakers, um, you can add them to the questions box, and they will address them towards the end of the session. So today's topic is how to make your brand look more attractive to private equity, and it is brought to us by Benetrends Financial. Um, here to provide today's discussion are Eric Schechterman, uh, Chief Development Officer with Benetrends, and Ryan Zink, CEO and co-founder of Franchise Fastlane. Uh, thank you both so much for joining us today, and thank you again to Benetrends for sponsoring today's webinar. Um, I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to Eric and Ryan to get us started, so you guys can go ahead and take it away. All right. Well, thank you, Sydney, and thank you, as always, to the IFA for everything that you do for our industry, our franchisees, our franchisors, the vendors, and all the different battles that you fight for us and support that you provide uh, to our industry. We're always uh, so fortunate to be a part of what the IFA does here at Benetrends. I know Ryan's got a lot of experience in working with them as well. And uh, thank you, Ryan, my guest today uh, for our conversation, our Wednesday Wise webinar. And uh, you know, Ryan, for those that um, don't know you, which would be surprising based off of your 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 run in this in this industry, um, mind just a quick little snapshot. Give me a quick little background bio. Um, you know, tell us uh, your your little franchise timeline if you don't mind. You bet. Well, I fell into franchising like a lot of people right out of college. Was working for a GNC franchisee. We had some success. We were buying underperforming GNCs around the country. Turned that into a good business and eventually turned it into a, a supplier, a nutritional product supplier to GNC franchisees. So really my first experience as a supplier. Uh, eventually then became a franchisor. Uh, franchise co-founded a company called Complete Nutrition. We uh, opened 200 locations around the country before we went through a private equity acquisition. And NDS, the supplier company, we went through a private equity acquisition of that as well. And then uh, from there, decided to get into the development side of things. And Co-founded Franchise Fastlane, and uh, for, if, for those of you that are not familiar, Franchise Fastlane, we're a franchise sales organization. We represent 18 franchise brands. We like to say next big thing franchise brands, and we are an extension of those brands. We do everything they need for development, except, of course, the funding. We send them over to Eric for that. Um, but we just try to be an extension of their brand, and uh, we've had a lot of success with those brands, and we help them not only grow, but try to give them a little bit of advice on the way to build infrastructure to keep up with that growth, and have had um, you know, six, seven of our brands over the last couple of years go through private equity acquisitions. We've also been part of the buy side for some private equity groups when they're looking at franchise brands, considering uh, whether or not Fastlane will, will help grow them. So very familiar with this whole topic. Yeah, this wasn't uh, just uh, spin the dial and pick the next guest. I will tell you that when I had an opportunity to host this webinar and, uh, you know, this was one of the topics that was being discussed um, it was pretty much uh, one name I was going to reach out to, and well, it was two names, but it was either you or Carrie, both with Franchise yeah. Fastlane. So um, I'm glad that I was able to uh, to work with you guys on this, and it's such a really fun topic. And what I love about it is, um, you know, I'm not the franchisor on the vending on the vendor side. Um, we're not the private equity side, but I just love hearing about this and I love watching our industry and talk about trends. And I think the reason that we're doing this webinar is I feel like no matter where you go today, if you go, whether it's a broker network conference, a discovery day, an IFA convention, a networking event, it is private equity, private equity, private equity, private equity. It's yeah. all that you hear. Um, People, development people mention it, owners mention it, candidates mention it, um, banks are mentioning it. I mean, it's just, it seems to be on the tip of everybody's tongue. And, you know, one thing that I uh, you know, love, and of course we're gonna talk about today, you know, how can you, as a franchisor, how do you get private equity to look at you? You know, how do we get them to want us? Are you ready? Um, what are they looking for? But before we even dive into any of that, you know, some of my favorite parts of, of this is, and it reminds me, and hopefully this doesn't go over the head of too many people, but uh, for any Seinfeld fans that are out there, 
there's an episode where Kramer's telling Jerry to write something off on his taxes. And Jerry says to Kramer, he's like, you don't even know what a write-off is. And Kramer says, no, I don't, but these companies do, and they're the ones writing it off. And it just shows he was telling someone to do something, but knew nothing about it. And not to be rude to anyone in the industry, because I will take this completely on my shoulders. I mean, I feel like private equity is the fifth word out of my mouth in some of these conferences. And I don't even really know exactly what it is. And I bet for every five people that talk about, oh, we're talking to private equity, or I know a guy, I just feel like it's such the hot button word, but if there's a lot of confusion. What is it? How does it work? Um, is there only one way to do it? So um, I, I just love getting that more of, we understand this is big, but let's take a step back. I always like the line, let's slow down so that we can move faster. Um, this is definitely not the first or last webinar or talking series that will focus on this, but I just feel like all of them have always been so detailed of, well, this is what they look at for all these different things. And these are the investment ranges and the return. I like to take it back and just really go with what is private equity? So, I mean, I can, of course, go through some of the, the details, but you know, Ryan, as you mentioned, um, from being a franchisor and going through that process, being on the fast lane side and working with brands, just from your perspective, I always like to say, explain it like you would explain to a five-year-old. What is private equity in, in its role in the franchise industry? Private equity is basically, it's, it's a group of people that act as a fiduciary for money they collect to then create a return, right? So think of it like anytime you're going to give your money to somebody, they hold it for a period of time and you, you have a certain risk tolerance and then it's their responsibility to create a return. So, you know, you have things on here like pension funds, endowments, high net worth individuals, and those people, they try to diversify their investments. So they're going to go into the stock market and the bonds into real estate, into all these investments, and they try to create diversity. So if one falls, another may be going up, right? And private equity is an investment tool. And some consider it maybe with a slightly higher risk uh, associated with it than if you were to go do a traditional investment, but also the intent is to have uh, much stronger returns. So that's, that's really what it is, right? What are those people doing? And there's thousands of them. I mean, there's many more private equity groups than you probably even realize there are all with different types of investments they look to make, which we can get into later. But how do they play a role in franchising? Well, they're a consolidator, in my opinion. Um, and so, you know, when you think about franchising, I believe that the IFA or, or the statistics come from somewhere that say about 5% of franchisors get to 100 units, right? There's, what, 3,500, 4,000 franchisors out there, and about 5% get to 100 units. So in this massive business segment, a very small percentage actually ever get to that point where you would consider them royalty sufficient or uh, you know um, on the on the verge of becoming a national brand. So what private equity does is they need they try to insert themselves into a point where they can have tremendous confidence that a brand is going to be able to continue in their revenue or continue in their core business while also having quite a bit of upside. Because the thing you need to remember about private equity, they're not going to make a heck of a lot for, you know, their, their traditional hold is going to be three to five years, maybe as much as seven. So they're not going to create a ton of cash flow during that time, usually. Usually when their return happens is when they sell it to the next larger private equity group. And so you always need to think about not only is my, can they have confidence in my business today, but is there a clear path to a larger business in the future that they could then someday sell to a larger private equity firm? Yes, yeah, and one comment that you made that has fascinated me is, like you said, that there's not just really one lane that they play in. You know, it's amazing what franchising creates. A family friend that I've known for 30 years, I was asking him what he does. He's like, oh, well, we're a private equity firm. We uh, invest in this, invest in this, and also we own 30 locations of this franchise concept and this. So private equity has even found a way in franchising where they might not invest into the franchise or acquire a brand, but they might even just acquire a block of active open locations as essentially franchisees. Um, have you seen that as well in your, in your time with working with them? Oh, a lot. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, especially, you know, I know there's a big movement into things like Planet Fitness, into Orange Theory, Massage Envy had it years ago. Um, you know, when you start to get to this scale, what, what private equity identifies is there's not a lot of open territory left. And so when there's not a lot of open territory left, what does it do to existing locations? It, it increases their value. 
and they have enough capital to go purchase uh, ind individual ones, twos, and threes at a time, but then eventually grow that to, to, in your example, 30 or more locations, when now they can increase their multiple, right? Because the more consistent the business, the bigger returns, the higher multiple. So Eric, what you just said happens all the time, both uh, acquisitions of franchisors and franchisees. So when I go home and I tell my eight-year-old private equity, essentially it's a pool of funds that people can use to make investments and that investment could be stock market, it could be tech, and it could be stuff just like daddy does every day working with franchise brands. And it's really just a matter of people looking at franchising to your point as maybe this is a better investment that has a more proven track record that I can see versus investing in other companies that I can't see those trends in. Exactly. And if, if I could just hit on that real quick, a better investment. So why? So let's say you're a um, ins insulation franchisor and I'm an insulation supplier and we have the same net profits. Well, when a, when a private equity group comes in and looks at our two companies, the difference between the two is my customers as a supplier, they can fire me at any time, right? I might have some supply agreements, but the majority of them buy from me as needed. The difference for you as a franchisor is you have franchisees that have signed a franchise agreement. Usually these are going to be, you know, five, seven, 10 years long. And so there is a, um, there is a franchising as a mechanism for a private equity group to come in and say, okay, we have a hundred franchise agreements with this many years each. This is the average revenue. This is the royalty. And they can get a clear and understandable pr prediction of what future revenue is just off your current business today. And so yours is gonna trade or yours is gonna sell at a higher multiple than mine because my customers could walk away from me at any time. That's why franchising is so attractive to private equity. Yeah, it really is fascinating. I, I feel like maybe seven, eight years ago, I felt like when we I would be around other investors, friends, family, certain things that were in other markets, it's like, oh, you're in franchising. You almost felt like you were the outsider. Now it's like you say you're in franchising and it's like, Oh, wow, we just started looking at this and looking at that. And people that never, from buying for themselves to private equity to investments to um, acquiring brands, it really is fascinating. Now, I know you touched on this a little bit at the beginning, but I think because of your background of, to your point, brands that Fastlane has built from the FSO side that then led to acquisition to your own brands, to being on both sides of the equation, um, what have you seen in all of these transactions? Like, why have the brands you've worked with had so much success? What's worked? What hasn't worked? Kind of give us a little, uh, you know, secret sauce here, if you don't mind. Yeah, you know, and the way that Fastlane brands have done it might be different than others. Um, Fastlane, they're, they're pretty high growth brands. And so our brands traditionally, when they bring on private equity um, partners, it's because they are some of the fastest growing in the country and private equity sees that they've been able to grow quickly. They see that they have a predictable royalty stream and they want to they want to become part of those brands before that next wave or that, you know, if they're at 100, 200, 300 territories, private equity wants to come in and take them to a thousand. For our founders, the reason some of our founders have decided to go that route is, you know, one, of course, it's attractive to take uh, chips off the table. Many times as a founder of a franchise brand, the heavy percentage, you know, probably 95 percent or more of your net worth is tied into the value of your company. And like anybody will tell you, concentration creates wealth, diversification preserves it. So when you diversify some of your net worth out of your business, you preserve that and you create wealth long term. But also these founders, they're thinking about what infrastructure do I need to put in place in order to support it from 200 territories to 600? And sometimes they don't feel that they necessarily have the experience or the team to do it. And so when you bring in private equity, if you choose the right one, they can sort of I don't love this term, but professionalize your management, which is not always a great thing, but they, they bring in people who might have experience doing that. They have the capital needed to invest into building infrastructure. So, you know, take some chips off the table, diversify your net worth and really bring in a partner that's going to help you take it from this level to the next level. Yeah, I know. I mean, between just Monster Tree, Redbox, Mosquito Shield, Premier Martial Arts, Conserva, Color World. I mean, those are all brands within the last few years that I mean, essentially, Fastlane was building and doing the, the, the franchise development for that all sold to private equity. Um, you know, so from the selling side, what are you what have you seen that's really attracted different investors? And you know what? And, and again, I uh, apologize for anything I don't clearly understand, but I always like to assume if I'm asking the question, somebody else might. 
private equity is one thing. Well, is private equity these multi-unit franchisors that have different verticals that they're involved in? Um, like I know Authority Brands bought Monster Tree. So is Authority Brands a private equity or is it um, you know a multi-unit franchisor? Because I think some people think, well, they're two different or are they one of the same? So just love to clarify. I really would love people to get an idea that before they go looking for this route, that they truly understand what it means. Yeah, so you, you, Authority Brands is a good example. Lynx is a good example. You know, they own um, uh, several several home service franchise brands, outdoor living brands. But so so let's just take them. They have a fine. They have a private equity group, which is the the money, right? This that group's job is to go out and raise funds through those areas that you said, endowments, pensions, high net worth individuals, whatever. And then they make investments into, into verticals. Well, they may decide, okay, we want to get into the franchising vertical. So they go and they purchase authority, purchase or create authority brands. So authority brands, they are a multi-brand franchisor. They are not a private equity group. They are owned by a private equity group. And so it's sort of one and the same because, sure. you know, they'll have crossover ownership of some of those things and they make decisions together, but ultimately they have two very different mechanisms inside of the same organization. Is that, is that clear it up? No, that's perfect. That's perfect. And, and don't confuse that with a strategic. Um, some franchisors will get acquired by a strategic. Now, a strategic is just going to be somebody who feels that a brand is a good fit to their core business. An example of that is Belfour bought Redbox Plus. So Belfour is a, one of the largest restoration companies in the country. What do they need um, often? They need roll off trash containers, right? So they can either go and rent them or purchase them from somebody else, or they can make an acquisition in that category and start renting from themselves. And that was the idea behind, I think anyway, I don't know all the details, but I think that was the reason that they decided to make the acquisition of Redbox Plus. All right, that's a strategic when they already have a core business that will utilize the product of the company that's being acquired. So from the fast lane perspective, with just those six brands just in the last few years that you've pretty much have developed to the point where they made themselves attractive for acquisition. Um, how, why, like what's worked, what, what didn't exist with these brands before that existed once they were with you guys or things that you just saw that they did during that time period that led to this because even some of these they were sort of rocket ships as well to the point of their growth and acquisition yeah well there's so let me start with the one i think big misconception on what will turn into a private equity value and then i'll get into the things that work the misconception yeah. is your franchise your franchise fees are usually not going to be considered in your EBITDA when determining a multiple. So if, if you sell um, Omaha, Nebraska, Omaha, Nebraska is not going to get sold again. That franchise fee was collected by you, but there's not an opportunity to sell Omaha, Nebraska again. So a private equity group, they're going to come in and they are going to usually discount or not give you credit for that in your financials because they're not going to give you a multiple of it. Uh, whereas a royalty will continue to repeat over and over again. That's going to get a large multiple. So I think you should consider your franchise fees as a mechanism for development and support, not necessarily for net profits that are going to turn into a multiple. I think that's a misconception. So the things that the brands have um, that were attractive to private equity are they have, um, I already said it, but I'm going to say it again because it's so important, hundreds and hundreds of franchise agreements that are a guaranteed royalty, right? They have a track record of proven performance, right? So the same store sales or same territory sales, whatever you want to call it, I would tell you, you better be up and to the right if you expect to get any kind of strong multiple on your brand. If, you're, if your same store sales or same store territory sales are going the opposite direction, going down, that's more of a fire sale and you really don't want to sell in that situation unless you have to because you're going to get a deep discount um they have infrastructure they have validation uh many times not many almost every time you're looking at a private equity acquisition they're going to want to talk to your people they're going to want to talk to your franchisees your team your key leadership vendors and they need to get a sense of what the brand is like remember they are a fiduciary and if they're spending millions and millions of dollars to acquire your brand they can't go back to the people that gave them money and say oops, I missed that in due diligence. So they have to go through a tremendous amount of due diligence. Typically, you know, uh, assume that'll be 60 to 90 days once you've identified the partner, which we should probably talk about the process later. But once you've identified the partner, you can go 60 to, 60 to 90 days just in due diligence, which is going to take you absolutely away from your day-to-day -day responsibilities because it's so consuming. Um, these brands, they have infrastructure, infrastructure that the private equity group feels they can leverage to go to the next level. 
they have a national brand, they have good customer reviews, they have national vendor relationships. Um, you know, each brand's a little bit different, but they all have some core business that is stood up around infrastructure and they have growth going like this. That's very attractive for private equity to come in and, and, and become part of it. Yeah, you know, it's funny, even uh, from working with uh, your team and seeing the brands over the years, I always remember you and Kerry talking about, you know, necessities and niceties, and even the way that you select brands, because um, FSO should almost operate just like any other thing. You don't want to just partner with anyone, and Fastlane probably does a better job than anyone. Um, so what are some of the things that you look for that also correlate to, you know, that eventually the potential PE firms are going to look for? Because it's not just about okay, well, we think this is a great market. You need to see some things when you're looking at brands that I think probably translate very well to what makes that brand attractive to a private equity firm down the road. Yeah, great question. So the, these things we look for that will also be looked for in a private equity group. Number one, a unique selling proposition, right? It doesn't have to be unique. I mean, you know, there's plenty of Me Too franchise concepts out there, but if you have something unique in your business that they can sink their fingers into, that's always helpful. Um, you need experienced leadership. Uh, you as a key leader, whether you're the founder or a key leader in the franchise, you don't sell to private equity and then walk away traditionally. Usually you're going to have a role in that company ongoing, right? Private equity doesn't come in just to take everything over. That's what a strategic does. Private equity, they come in and say, we want to leverage the people in the infrastructure that you've already got in place. So know that you're usually going to be signing up for multiple years post private equity transaction. Um, we're, they're looking for strong financial returns, right? Happy franchisees. Private equity wants to come in and leverage a business model that somebody has created so they can then take it to scale. So they're going to speak to franchisees. They want to know that they're making money. Um, opened or excuse me, sold, but not opens. This is really important if you're retail, right? Many times retail concepts will say, we've got 200 sold, but they got 20 open, right? And then what the private equity group's going to do is they're going to come back and they're going to look at the, the development schedule. And they're going to say, if you give a year to your franchisees to open locations, what percentage of them are opening on time and what percentage of them are opening late? You know, you would think in your mind, I got 180 to open. That's great. Private equity is going to love it. But if they go back and see there's some fundamental flaws in the development schedule, they're going to think, well, why are franchisees not motivated to stay within schedule? Why is the franchisor not to have a system to ensure franchisees are opening? So that's going to be an immediate discount for a retail based one. Um, I can yeah, go on. I can jump in there real quick, Ryan, because I think the the sold not open is such a big topic um, in so many different directions. But one, I think when people say, well, hey, I don't want to sell too many and not get them open are exactly right, because they, you know, a private equity firm still wants to say, like, wow, look at this trough of business that we're going to get open and collect royalties on and build this business. And But to your point, the other one is you don't want to have a bunch that has been sold and has been lying stagnant for so long. So um, is there, uh, you know, how was that presented? Uh, you don't want to just say, hey, we've got 500 sold, not open. To your point, you want to show that either there's a track record, is there a number or multiple that you've seen? How have the, the, the sold, not open numbers been looked at from different firms? I, I really believe it goes back to what I said. It's just whether or not they're being opened, what percentage of them are being opened on time? Um, and then whatever percentage that is, the private equity group's going to multiply that out across the number that you have sold and say, OK, if you got 200 sold and, you know, 60 percent of them are opening on time, we assume that, you know, you now have what's that number? 120 um, <laughs> that are, are quality that we think are going to open and 80 that are not. And so you're going to immediately get a discount or no credit for those 80. It's a very important that when you sell multi-unit on a retail concept, franchisees are opening according to the development schedule. And it's something to think about in the beginning, too, on what's the end goal. Many times I talk to retail franchisors and say, I want everyone to open within one year. And then you say, OK, a couple of things to consider. You don't want it to be so quick that the franchisee has to take their eye off the ball of their existing location before it's ready and move into de development of the second one. And if you start to have people missing development schedules, now you have to get litigious or have to have some solution with your franchisees in order to get them back on track or to take the territory back. So in my opinion, I'd always say err on the, on the side of go a little bit longer than you think you may need because you don't wanna have to backtrack. I understand that means you might be delaying royalties and sometimes, but I'd rather have strong location one before somebody is moving on to location number two. Yeah, and uh, I will tell you, even on the lending side, when we're working with banks and they're looking at brands, 
and they look at, wow, there's this much or this much, and we're going to talk about some action items. But one thing I've heard uh, some brands do um, that's just been phenomenal is you don't have to just look at your sold as sold or not open, or you know either open or not open. It could be sold in in development, looking at real estate. It could be like sold not open is just the license is there. As we all know in the franchise world, there are so many different stages along the way before it gets to open. And I I would think if you're going to private equity saying yeah we have 300 so that are not open, but 70% of those are already signing leases, this percent is signing that. I would assume data, is, especially in today's world, is always gonna be key to groups like this. Absolutely, yep, the, the data is gonna be something that they look at and, and that's what they're gonna go with. You know, you, you, you could give your opinion on why things are behind, but typically the data wins. Yeah, I wanna talk about a couple of other areas about structure, systems, you know, vendors, funding, certain things like that, but, um, one that I've always heard is, um, which I think has changed because of the potential for growth like you have seen. Um, but when I first came into the industry, I was always told private equity only comes in to buy the leader. They buy number one in the space. But usually number one in, this, uh, in a space means we built our business and we're the best, which means they probably established everything. That seems to have changed a lot now because again, you wanna be able to have that growth and be able to grow something. But is there a different thing that they look at uh, from being a leader in either a specific product or market or category, or is that almost a little bit irrelevant now? It's not irrelevant. I mean, look at Orange Theory. I think you know several years ago, Orange Theory sold for the largest multiple in, in franchising history, if I remember that correctly. Why? Because they were really the leader in boutique fitness, which at the time was a category that was exploding and you've seen others come behind it. Um, but then there's also value in a, in a, in a me too is the wrong word, but a, a business that's got an established segment. And I'll just use, you know, one of our brands, Mosquito Shield, recently went through an acquisition, a very successful acquisition. You know, there's seven, eight, nine Mosquito franchises. I don't know how many there are, but Mosquito Shield was able to come in and establish uh, uh, professional leadership. They have great leadership there. They have momentum at their back. They've developed several hundred locations over the last couple of years. They do have a unique selling proposition in the fact that they have some proprietary systems that they lean on, marketing. They also have a product that's proprietary to them, right? So even though they weren't necessarily the first uh, in, you know, as far as a national brand is considered in that space, they still provide a tremendous value for a private equity partner that looks at the country and maybe even the world and says, where else can we go develop this? And do they have the brand and the infrastructure that will allow us to do it? So that, you know, if they were the very first mosquito company to do it, would they have maybe got a better value? Probably, but I think they're still very attractive to a partner. No, I think what you said before, it's, it's, you don't have to be the unique product. You might not have to have the unique service, but having something to show beyond just, we're just another business that does the same thing everybody else does is still something that's going to be a part of it but um so on structures systems we talked about obviously in my world of working with emerging brands the different fso's the different acquisitions um not so much funding of the acquisition but when a private equity firm comes and looks at a brand you know and they're looking at the management team and they're looking at the systems they're looking at the development I assume they're looking at, okay, they also have relationships with, hey, if I'm a brick and mortar business that has a lot of equipment, do we have the equipment relationship in place? Do we have the real estate company in place? Do we have funding lined up? Are there lenders that are looking to do this through SBA? Are there other relationships? How have you seen that either help or hurt um, from any of the funding or vendor relationships that you recommend brands have in place um, that, that's been attractive to private equity? Yeah, that's a simple answer. The stronger the relationships, uh, the, the more attractive your brand is going to be. I'm a believer that franchisors should concentrate on their core business and outsource the rest to experts. Um, and so if I'm a dry cleaning franchise, I want to be the best dry cleaner in the world. I want to know how to acquire those customers and I want to know how to service them better than anybody else. But it doesn't mean I need to know how to do the manufacturing of, of the machines work or how um, you know, how many relationships Benetrends has with various banks that are going to go get the SBA funding. I leave that to you. Or if, if you're working with an FSO, the exact way to set up the, uh, the process to make my brand look attractive, right? Let the experts go do those things. And so as you're going through a private equity acquisition, they're going to ask you about every piece of your business. And it's totally appropriate for you to say, 
we don't go uh, get local funding for our franchisees. We call up Eric at Benetrends and that's his core competency. That's what he does for us. Then in many times, private equity group might knock on your door at Benetrends and say, hey, can you give us some statistics? How many times have people looked at this? How many have been SBAs? How many have been rollovers? Can you give us some, some data around your experience with this brand? And when you're working with experts, a lot of times they can provide that data better than you would be able to build it internally anyway. So long answer to say, the stronger your relationships with vendors, the more attractive your brand's gonna be. Well, to your point, I mean, most of these places are not coming in to be the expert operators. That's what you're there for. And they want to know that what they bought is focusing on building that business, not dealing with who's getting the equipment delivered and who's doing that, who's got make, who's got the right lenders in place. But to your point, if they want to grow something on the funding side, obviously they want to see that. Is there enough funding options that are out there? Like if you're not an SBA eligible concept, it's likely not going to be something that somebody might be as attracted to because it limits the pool of funds that you can eventually grow that business with um, or different concepts, especially in the post COVID era. So just keep that in mind. I think that's a good transition to, um, you know, sort of the, the next part of the conversation is, you know, we're talking about all these different things of when private equity looks at you and says, when they finally come in and say, this is what we're looking for. But let's say a brand is nowhere near this now or they're close or whatever, what, what can a brand do now? Um, like, what are things that they can do that um, takes time to implement that they might not have in place? Um, what really just costs money and they can implement? And what are some of the, the low hanging fruit and, and easy things? I mean, obviously I'll, I'll chime in as I always do on the funding side and amazed that the franchisors that don't take advantage of either what Benetrends or any of the funding partners out there provide for their candidates that typically cost them nothing, but you know, you've worked with so many brands that you took from those infant stages. Uh, I'm sure there were some moments where like, wow, I'm surprised they, they don't already do this. We can just flip a switch and do this. Or what are some things just, uh, if you don't mind, kind of spend some time there. Yeah, um, having your financials in order is so important, right? So having somebody on your team that uh, controller, CFO, outsourced, it doesn't matter, but have a very strong sense of your numbers and make sure you have a consistent accounting system. You know, you don't want to go from cash to accrual back to cash. Are you uh, are you typically going to um, uh, account for something over the course of the life of the, for instance, if you have a marketing investment that's a 12 month marketing investment, are you booking that for the month that the cash goes out or are you going to accrue it over the 12 months? Just consistency in the way that you do your numbers and understanding of them, have some financial literacy when people ask you questions. Um, another, and this might sound basic, but the core focus of a franchisor should be to build a business franchisees want to be a part of. And so really focus in on that core business, on what your franchisees are saying they need to be successful, watch their numbers, listen to their validation, understand their pain points. If you create a better widget or just something that's attractive to franchisees, the rest sort of falls into place because with a good brand comes more franchisees. With more franchisees comes more royalties, more royalties, more people, more infrastructure. You know, and it, it just... And, that's why private equity is attracted to it because it's hard. It's hard to do all those things, but it all starts with the attractive brand. And, and you know, that point of um, financials, another thing that you can think about is your key leadership. How sticky is your company for your key leadership? How dependent are you on them? You know, if, uh, my old business, we were a product franchise or we had a lot of product and we had a supply chain manager that was very good, but we were very dependent on him. So when we went through the process of private equity, we had to make sure that he was uh, taken care of through that process, that he was going to be part of the company long term. There was a financial upside for him because without him, it would have been very difficult to operate the business. So think about those core people, because if one of them were to leave, uh, how susceptible is your business or how vulnerable is your business to that category? Um, those yeah, are a couple you know what? I'll chime in right there. And, you know, because I love when we when I've heard brands that say it's amazing some of the most simple things. Like you talk about the management team, the amount of franchise brands that I'll meet through the emerging process because they want to talk about the different funding strategies. And it's just like, what does this person do? Well, they do a little bit of this, a little bit of that. They do it like, listen, let them continue to do that. That's fine. But from an outsider's perspective, having clearly defined roles, titles, um, you need to look, smell, and act like what a private equity brand. And it could be as simple as just having the right people in place that if somebody said, 
What is this? How does this business operate? They could come in in 20 minutes and figure it out. They don't want to be told the story of, well, we do this or we do this or we do that. It's just interesting that you mentioned about the management team and who's the right fit and are they sticky to your business? And sometimes it's even knowing what titles to give them and how to outline. It's, you know, and uh, it's easy. Well, it's easy from the outside to say, the way that it should happen. And the challenge is we know for an emerging franchisor is financial resources, working capital, right? So they bring somebody in and they say, you know, my hope is someday you're going to lead marketing or you're going to lead training, but today I need you to do several things. So the way I like to position that, or I have positioned that when my companies have grown from, grown from being very small to large, is you're going to start as a Swiss army knife. And eventually we're going to transition you into a steak knife. So in the beginning, you got to have all kinds of functions. You got to be able to do it all over time. We're going to add more and more resources to the team where you can become very specialized and eventually hopefully all you're doing is cutting steak all day right i mean it's just that evolution and you need you need the money in order to hire the people to do that yeah and that's uh you know such a great point of just pointing out those different things that they can focus on that over time has such a such a huge impact um so what are some things that you know we talked about some hey this is something you can do simple this is something you can do tomorrow um, anything that you've seen any in your experience that you did when you were the franchisor side on the FSO side uh, that you've seen brands that, yes, they made an investment. This did cost some time or some money or it wasn't an ultimate switch, but um, the, the return on investment was you know, tenfold. Yeah, technology is usually the answer of that. Um, you know, for I'll, I'll use my example. When, when we were a franchisor, we built a dashboard a KPI dashboard. And prior to that, it was a lot of sending reports every every so often. Once we built that dashboard and we trained that this should be the first thing that you go to every morning as a franchisee, it, it, it raised the level of awareness and education for all of our franchisees on who was doing well, why were they doing it, what categories were leading to success, and we all collectively became smarter and it created competition. When you saw 200 stores, you know, and, and you saw where you ranked, you naturally want to go higher on the list or understand what the people above you were doing. So I'm a big believer in technology. Also just simple things like when we implemented new technology, we also started collecting royalties weekly as opposed to monthly. It made a huge change in our incoming cash flow, right? And so just little financial systems like that, because now royalties are being collected weekly, which creates more cash for us, but also isn't such a strain on the franchisee. Instead of pulling out several thousand dollars a month, we would maybe just pull out you know, a, a much smaller amount every week, which was bite-sized pieces for franchisees. But anyway, to answer that question, I think it always goes back to uh, technology or possibly customer acquisition. If you have the right marketing systems in place, the right tracking tools for that, and you can be, help your franchisees become much more efficient at how they acquire customers, that's always gonna be um, top of the list. Yeah, and it's funny some of the stuff that you just mentioned there. I think what we all need to remember, you know, like in our businesses, who your audience is. Well, on the private equity side, not making any assumptions, but assuming these are people that have come from financial backgrounds, worked in finance, looking at numbers, certain universities, certain background, what they've even looked at before. Again, private equity might have been, they might acquire all these different investments and never been in franchising. Now they start looking. And they come and it's oh yeah well some days we do this and uh, well i have the the numbers of the sales reps scribbled over here on the side and then i go to this place and it's here's our numbers here's our sold not open here's the average time from lead to close here's where we get our leads from and all of those things i mean again not to i know you're my guest so it's not to just uh, you know pump you up but i mean uh, on the fast lane side people have always asked me you know why have you seen such success there now um, before joining Benetrends a little over 10 years ago, I worked for a company named Syntox Corporation for 10 years. And I would argue that's probably one of the best sales training organizations in the country. I know it's not the sexiest product of shirts, pants, mats, mops, and toilet paper, but it was a fantastic experience. And I said, they are the first people that I've ever seen do what we do in this industry like a real company. And I know that's not to knock other brands, not to, but to your point, if somebody looked at Fastlane, can anybody question the structure of the people there? I mean, I've seen the, the tree a billion times of here's who does this, here's who does that, here's this team. Um, the data that everybody has from what leads come from this group, the lead to close ratio, there's a reason to do that, not just to manage your business better, 
But for somebody that's going to come in and look at it, they don't want to implement too many brand new systems. They want to see that you have it. Mm -hmm. And they've been looking at stocks, bonds, mutual funds. Um, you know, they come in and look at, I mean, imagine what has to be in place for one of these groups to say, yeah, mosquito company. That sounds exactly what we want. Um, you know, I've always heard uh, one of the top franchisors in the country um, always argue and say, we are a technology company that happens to be a fitness franchise. Mm -hmm. And I think if you start thinking of your brands that way, especially in 2022, uh, you know, looking at what you can implement there will be great. Um, Eric, can I say something? Can, yeah, can please, I add to that? So an important distinct, something important to distinguish from what you just said too is what type of investment you want to be to a private equity group. So you, there's a platform investment and there's an add-on investment. So a platform investment is when somebody is entering a space for the first time. So let's just think of a, 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 a franchisor again, a family franchisor. If a private equity group wants to get into the franchising for the first time, that first franchise brand they acquire has to be completely buttoned up from a system perspective because they don't know any better. They don't have an historical, the, the PE group doesn't have a historical background on how to do it differently. So that is gonna set the standard. Then they can start acquiring other franchisors to bolt on and they're, they have a best practice or a model to replicate on how it should be done. Whereas if you don't have strong systems, you're probably not going to be attractive as a platform company. You're going to be the add-on. You're going to go become that fifth franchisor in the family of 10 or, or whatever that looks like. And usually that's just not going to be valued the same as the platform company. So that those systems make you a different level of investment to get you a, a stronger return. And um, if you think it's valuable, I know you have more on the slide here. We could talk a little bit about how private equity groups will value a company as they think about, um, you know, how much can I sell it for? Now, I think it's a great area to continue on right now. So let, let, let's stick to that because that's that's such a great aha moment of people realizing if you don't have these systems, I'm essentially just saying it's easier for me to take your name and trademarks and some things that are in place and bolt it on. Um, or you have all these things and you're my, my starship that I'm building off of. Um, and being that we're on that, I think it's absolutely worth um, from what your perspective has been as how those values are looked at. Okay, great, thanks. Well, we already talked about systems and legal contracts or franchise agreements. So let's assume that you know that's been addressed well enough because that's gonna, every intangible is then also gonna become part of the value. But the core structure that uh, a PE group's gonna use is EBITDA and addbacks. So EBITDA stands for earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization, right? So your core net profit number, um, or your core EBITDA number, I should say. And then there's something that's called addbacks. So an ad back would be a non-recurring expense. Um, I'll give you an example. This year, uh, we sent our entire support team on what we call a repeat retreat. And what that means is because we repeated uh, or exceeded, I should say, 2021 exceeded 2020, everybody who was a non-salesperson on our team, we sent them and a significant other to a tropical vacation. That's not something we do every year. That was something that was one time. So if somebody was valuing our company, they would say, well, that was a one-time occurrence. That's now an ad back. That's not going to count against your net profits. There's other scenarios. Maybe you've got a seven-year history of being a franchisor, and you happen to have gotten to a lawsuit this year. First time you've ever had done it. Well, you've proven the last, you've got a historical track record of not getting into lawsuits. And so maybe your expenses into that lawsuit could be considered an ad back. Maybe you did some secondary education or some travel, or you had to make an investment into a technology product that you only have to invest into one time maybe that's going to be an ad back. There's things that you would then add back. So let's say our core EBITDA is a million dollars and then you have ad backs of a hundred thousand dollars. So now your, your, your addressable or your multiple is going to be based off of $1.1 million. Then they have to determine what that, what your multiple is going to be. So again, are you a platform company? If you're a platform company, you're going to get a stronger multiple. Do you have strong systems? Do you have great legal contracts? Are your franchisees opening on time? How confident are we in your revenue? So there's a buzzword in franchising right now called recurring revenue. Gym memberships, uh, mosquito companies, uh, anything that you can create that's gonna say, I am going to come back and service you or you're gonna get something from me week after week, month after month, and the revenue just continues to pour in. Those are typically valued at a stronger multiple than let's say something that you have to constantly go out and give estimates or constantly uh, go out and acquire the next customer. Um, and then I already shared that royalties and, and vendor rebates are going to be valued differently than franchise fees. Vendor rebates get overlooked. You know, again, in my previous life as a nutrition franchisor, we had royalties, but then we also had product sales. 
about 80% of all the sales inside of the system came from private label or branded product that we had a margin on. That made up a pretty significant number. So when, when we went through our process, we valued our royalties and our product dollars almost the same, even though one of them was legally bound in a, in a contract and the other wasn't. But because we had that money coming from something besides royalties, that was valued uh, the same way. So again, EBITDA, addbacks, you get a multiple of that based on how consistent and, and, and how predictable your business is. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm sure, or I would hope that there's people on the line that are probably, like, oh my God, I just never even considered that or thought of that. Um, so, I mean, all of this is great info. I definitely want to leave uh, some opportunity for some questions, but obviously on the selfish side and on the, the part that I see as well is when we talk about things that are easy to implement and everything else, I mean, it still blows my mind today when a brand says, well, no, I mean, either one, we don't need to have a funding resource for candidates. We let them go on their own or, you know, we sort of do it ourselves or X, Y, and Z. And it's just, and it's amazing. And the most amazing part, it's not because it's not only the industry that I'm in and something we've done at Bank Trends for so many years, it costs the franchise or nothing. I mean, I'm always amazed when I, I speak to a franchise or when I say, listen, what we're gonna do is, um, number one, do you have a development website separate to your company website? Maybe Ryan, you might even wanna chime in on that if that's something that people look for. You have your service website where your customers are going, but what about a website that's just dedicated to the development and sales of your franchise? And when I go to them and I say, well, we're gonna build out a funding page for that so people know how to buy your business. We're gonna implement a funding calculator on that website as a lead capture tool. So one, you're getting more leads, and two, when your development people are working those leads, they can see that the person at least is realistically financially qualified. And then having a partner that goes out and find banks for you, pre-qualifies them, works with your candidates, and then they're like, oh my God, this is great. And then they find out, well, by the way, this costs you nothing as a franchise brand. And you know, my line is always, um, I just have one rule. If I messed up, you tell me I messed up, give me a chance to fix it. If we don't fix it, you fire us and you, you move on. There's no contracts. And just the amount of brands, oh no, we're good because you know our people have self-funded. Well, if you're an emerging brand, yes, we most brands start off with their candidates self-funding a customer, a local client, whatever it may be. But if um, one, if you're just gonna grow as an emerging brand, but two, if you think you're gonna have an investor, a private equity firm, a multi-level franchisor come and look at you and they say, well, how many of your franchisees self-funded? How many went through SBA? How do you qualify candidates? And you don't have those answers. To be able to implement that literally at the drop of a hat with no cost, um, it's still just amazing. And hopefully many on the line already have that in place, but um, so on my, well, sorry, I'll, go ahead. I'll just, I'll, I'll back you up because I have experience. When I was a franchisor, it was before I understood funding partners like you guys, right? Um, and so we went to local bank relationships and had franchisees go to local bank relationships and it was really difficult because it was constant education of the brand and you know, just lots of, I don't get it, tell me more and challenges to get funding. Now. Back then, we awarded 200 locations. Now, Franchise Fastlane, in the last few years, we've awarded 4,000 locations, and I would not do it any other way. I mean, you, there's no way that we would ever try to do the funding on our own or through a local relationship. I mean, we go through um, groups like yours for every single deal um, because it is you're doing nothing but making us look better and getting deals done quicker for us. Yeah, so, I mean, listen, this isn't a, uh, whoever is out there, have your funding relationship set up. If it's a local bank, if it's another group that you've worked with, <clears throat> I always say one of the best takeaways I tell people, listen, if you have 50 franchisees and 50 of them all did SBA loans, call those franchisees, find out the names of the bank that they got their loan done. Pick up that phone and call that bank. That bank has shown an appetite already for your business. Ask them that they would, would be willing to take on more. I mean, I love that we help out a lot of, there's a lot of things that these brands can do. So, um, so much great information. All I would obviously suggest is pick one, start there, implement that, pick another, and, and always look at it from what costs time, what costs money, what costs mistakes, because, you know, something as simple as Ryan said is having the right data, having the right titles within management, 
leveraging your vendor relationships. I mean, let's face it, those are, I always like to say there's skill issues and there's will issues. And I have a high tolerance for skill issues with my sales team and a very low tolerance for will issues that are just effort. I would like to say, let's figure out what the effort things are first. And uh, I think from that, a lot of the franchisors will find themselves making themselves more attractive to whether it's investors, private equity, or just making yourself a better all overall franchisor. So with that being said, I want to leave some time for any questions that the group has. I know some came in through the chat box. Um, Ryan, any anything that matters as far as somebody said, if I'm a franchisor and all of my units have been sold as single units and all are open, does that help hurt? Do people look at more, they want more locations open with less owners or is that taken into account at all? You know, it, it just really depends on the type of business and what your thesis around the right way to manage it is. You know, if you have a lot of owner operators and that's important for your business for whatever reason, single owners all open is going to be fantastic for you. Right. Um, that's uh, and I'm assuming that's the case or else you wouldn't have developed it that way. So my guess is that's going to be very beneficial for you. Whereas opposed to you look at a Panera Bread and Applebee's, some other higher investments. I mean, they're I, I think at one time Applebee's had like 20 franchisees for the whole country. Right. <laughs> and they really wanted high level, sophisticated, huge franchise groups that they had to, to manage just a few relationships with. So as long as your thesis is that it should be single owners, then that's absolutely going to support your value. Absolutely. Um, multiples. I don't know how much detail we want to get in there, but you know, they, they, I always say like in the SBA lending world, it all depends. Um, but do the multiples change based on the amount of EBITDA? What have some of the common multiples been that you've seen? What should somebody expect? Or is it really a matter of like anything else, whatever somebody's willing to pay for your business is what it's worth? This is such a broad brush, so take it for what it's worth, not much, um, you know, but I, I've, I've got a sense of if you if you have a business that's creating five million or more of EBITDA, you should be able to get a stronger than an eight multiple, right? Um, if you're the franchisor, you have good financials, you're legally buttoned up, you got good systems, and there's still room for growth, you should be able to say, okay, I'm going to go out there and get eight, nine, 10, maybe even 11 multiple on that. Um, sub five you're probably you know reducing that uh, that even or that multiple just a little bit um and if you're not well i shouldn't say if you're not again this is all just such a broad brush but you know there's very the, the pool of potential private equity buyers if you're sub million dollar even is very small you're going to lose out on that competitive process i would say you probably want to get to in my opinion if i were doing it i'd want to get to at least three before i would even consider it. And if you're an, if you're a platform company, again, eight, nine, 10 should be the goal. If you're a franchisee, I've heard some of those going for three, four, five. Um, so, you know, there's uh, the level of control you have, the ability to control your own growth, the addressable market, your systems, your EBITDA, it all comes into play. Yeah. And from my limited knowledge, I would almost just say, just like anywhere else, like we deal with in the lending space, stop worrying about the well i once heard this one place sold for this one multiple like we all have the crazy stories of this sold for this to one and this you know all of these different things there's always the exceptions expect more of the rule and what people are going to look at and um just like anything else you can hear all these stories but something's only as valuable as somebody's willing to pay for it so if if you're the only one that they're looking at it doesn't mean that they have to come in and offer you what you heard a completely different model on a different vertical is offered well and, and you know it's also when you think about the actual cash at the end of the day a lot of times i think people get into the process and they hear what it's worth then they don't really um, translate that into what's post close going to look like and what that actually means in cash so let's use a 10 million dollar value so let's say you have a $10 million value. Well, usually you're gonna to have to have a rollover equity. A private equity group is not gonna come in and say, thanks for all you've done, see you later. They're gonna say you're valuable and we want you to be vested. Unless it's a strategic buyer, that's different. Private equity is usually gonna say, okay, why don't you roll 30% in? So right away, $3 million, you keep in the business. So now you got seven in cash, right? Then you got your taxes. Uh, well, actually even before taxes, you may have key employees. You have key employees that are somehow vested into a, into a uh, uh, key employee incentive program, that needs to come off of the top. Do you have a partner? And then you have taxes. So many times, you know, you might see a, a much larger valuation at the beginning of the process. And then when it actually comes time to put cash in your account, 
that's significantly less. So before you enter the process, I would highly encourage you to engage an investment banker. Let them walk you through the potential value, the process, what you're going to pay them, and then understand what your cash in hand is um, at the end of all of it. Absolutely. Spend money to make money sometimes. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, well, listen, thank you so much, Ryan. I think this is such so helpful. And again, there's so much great content available through the IFA. This is not, you know, the only webinar or you know, talking series that's going to cover private equity in the franchise space, but all I would tell everybody is do your research, know your business, and please, if you ever have any questions, um, obviously I have Ryan's email. You can always contact me directly. Um, and just understanding that all these little things all add up to make a little bit of a difference um, if this is the route that you want to go. Um, again, I'll leave a, another minute or so, Sydney, if we have any other questions. But if not, again, thank you everyone for attending today. Thank you to the IFA. At Benetrans, we're always ha happy to uh, support the IFA educational process. Um, and, and it was a proud member of that. And Ryan, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, it was my pleasure. It's a fun topic to talk about. All right. Uh, thank you, Eric and Ryan. Uh, right now, we do not have any other questions, but if anyone does have a question that comes to them a little bit later on, um, I will drop my email address in uh, the chat box so you can send it to me and I can pass it on to Eric and um, Ryan. But thank you both so much for your time. Uh, this is a great uh, webinar and I actually learned a lot myself. So I appreciate that. Um, and thank you everyone for joining us. So again, this webinar was recorded and uh, the presentation deck along with the recording will be uploaded to community.franchise.org either later this evening or tomorrow morning. Um, so just keep an eye on that. Um, but yeah, if you guys have any questions, again, you can ask, uh, email Eric or Ryan or shoot me an email and I'll uh, give it to them. But thank you both Eric and Ryan and Benetrends uh, for your time and the sponsorship of this webinar. And I hope everyone has a great rest of your day. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye.